This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about the Hilbert polynomial. So we will use the Hilbert polynomial in order to define the dimension of a um, local notarian ring. Um, for this lecture we won't really worry too much about um, dimension or local rings or whatever, and we'll just define the Hilbert polynomial as some sort of abstract object. So suppose we've got a graded ring R, so it's going to be graded as a sum over integers n of um, um, components Rn, and we're going to assume that R0 is notarian and R is finitely generated as an algebra over um, R0. So um, this implies R is notarian as well by Hilbert's theorem. And we're going to suppose that M um, is going to be a graded module over R. So it's going to be a sum of graded pieces Mn. So this is a module. And we're going to assume that M is finitely generated as a module. Remember, we have to distinguish between, between being finitely generated as a module or as an algebra. And the problem we want to discuss is how fast does Mn grow as, as n tends to infinity? Well, in order to discuss how fast it grows, we need to know what is the size of this. So we need to have some way to measure the size of a module. And we're going to um, denote its size of mn to be as lambda mn, which will be some sort of integer. And what is lambda of mn? Well, we've got to decide that. So we can say, what is lambda? Well, here's an easy case. Suppose we take r0 to be a field. Then mn is always a finite dimensional vector space over r0, and we can take lambda mn just to be the dimension over R0 of Mn. Um, a slightly more complicated case. Let's take R0 to be an Artinian ring. And then over Artinian rings, all finitely generated modules have finite lengths, so we can put lambda Mn is the length of Mn. And lambda needs to have the following basic property. So if, if we've got an exact sequence of modules over R0, then we want that lambda of A plus lambda of C is equal to lambda of B. So this sort of says lambda is additive or additive on short exact sequences or whatever. And this is basically the only property of lambda we need, apart from the fact that lambda should be integer valued. Um, if you know anything about K-theory, you can state this in a rather more exotic way, saying that lambda must be a homomorphism from a K-group of your ring R0 to the integers. But that's just a fancy way of saying it's additive. Um, so... Uh, now we can uh, put together all these numbers lambda into something called a Poincaré series. So we're going to define a formal power series in a variable t to be sum over n greater than or equal to zero of lambda m n times t to the n. So this is just a formal power series with integer coefficients. And we've got a basic theorem that says that pt is a rational function. Um, more precisely, 
pt is equal to f of t divided by 1 minus t to the k1 times 1 minus t to the k2 up to 1 minus t to the ks. Well, I need to explain what all these are. Well, first of all, this bit here is just a polynomial. And next we need to know what all these numbers here are. Well, k1, k2 up to ks are the degrees of the generators of R. So you remember R was a finitely generated algebra over R0, so we can pick generators of, of various degrees. Um, so uh, how do we prove this? Well, it's fairly easy to prove. Um, all we have to do is um, suppose the generators of the R algebra R0 algebra R, R x1 up to xs, where the degree of xi is going to be this funny number ki. We're going to use induction on s. So first of all, for, for s equals naught, this is trivial, because then r is equal to r0, and mn is equal to 0 for n sufficiently large, so the Poincaré series is just a polynomial. So pt is a polynomial whose coefficients are the dimensions of the, of the numbers mn. Suppose s is greater than 0, what we do is we look at the following sequence. We take the exact sequence, 0 goes to kn, goes to mn, goes to mn plus ks, goes to ln plus ks goes to 0, where this is just multiplication by xs. And if we look at k, which is the sum of all the kn's, and l, which is the sum of the ln's, then these are modules over, um, over r, in which xs acts as 0. Um, so l is just the um, co-kernel of, of multiplication by x and k is just the, 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 the kernel of it. Um, so if we look at this exact sequence here, then using the additivity of lambda, we get the following exact sequence. We get lambda kn minus lambda mn plus lambda mn plus ks minus lambda um, ln plus ks is equal to zero. So lambda is additive on exact sequences with three terms and you can break any exact sequence into exact sequences of three terms. So, so when if you've got an exact sequence of modules like this then the alternating sum of the lambdas is zero. So now we convert this formula into a formula for the Poincaré polynomials of k, l and n and if we do this we find pk of t minus pm of t plus t to the minus ks um, pm of t um, minus t to the minus ks pl of t is equal to zero. So, so this formula is just the same as this formula except we've written it in terms of Poincaré series. Well, now we do a little bit of algebra and we find pm of t can be written in terms of these two terms as pl of t um, minus t to the kspk of t divided by 1 minus t to the ks. And this now proves the theorem because these two terms here are rational functions with uh, denominators of the form 1 minus t to the something. So this expression here is also a rational function, except you've got to add an extra factor of 1 minus t to the ks in the, in the denominator. So that proves the formula for the Poincaré series of um, our module. Now we're going to look at the following special case 
In this special case, we're going to take all the xi of degree 1. So all the ki equal, are equal to 1, in other words. So this is the most common case, but it's sometimes useful to allow the xi's to have higher degree. So anyway, this says that pt is equal to some polynomial in t divided by 1 minus t to the s, where s is the number of generators. Well, um, 1 over 1 minus, um, so it should be 1 minus t to the s, of course, 1 over 1 minus t to the s um, can be expanded using the binomial theorem as sum over n greater than or equal to 0 of t to the n times n plus s minus 1, choose s minus 1. And we notice this is a polynomial in n if n is greater than or equal to 0. If, if n is less than 0, this becomes 0. And so this isn't a polynomial in n for all integers n, but it is for n greater than or equal to 0. So the coefficients of pt are polynomials in n, so I should say the coefficient of t to the n in pt, polynomials in n for n sufficiently um, large. Um, so you have to take n so that it's bigger than, than the degrees of any of the terms in this polynomial here, but once you've done that, all the coefficients of pt are going to be polynomials. Um, and these polynomials are integer valued. What this means is that p of an integer is an integer. Um, so uh, let's discuss um, integer valued polynomials for a bit. So we can ask what are the possible integer valued polynomials. This means they should take integers on integers. Well, um, there are some obvious examples. We can just take all coefficients to be integers. So we take integer linear combinations of 1, t, t squared, t cubed, and so on, or so sum of n, i, t to the i for n, i, n, z. However, these are not the only examples. For instance, we could take n times n minus 1 over 2. And um, um, this is always an integer whenever n is an integer, even though it's n squared over 2 minus n over 2. It doesn't have integer coefficients. More generally, if you take n, n minus 1, up to n minus i plus 1, divided by 1 times 2 up to i, um, this is always an integer if n is an integer and um, i is greater than or equal to 0. And that's because this is just the binomial coefficient n choose i, which is an integer because it's the number of ways of choosing a i from n, n elements. Um, so we can ask, are there any other integer valued polynomials? And the answer is no. This more or less gives all of them. So we have the following theorem. Any integer valued polynomial f is an integer linear combination of um, these polynomials n choose 0, n choose 1, n choose 2, and so on. So this is 1 n, n, n minus 1 over 2, n, n minus 1, n minus 2 over 6, and so on. And let's look at it for proof of this. This is quite easy. Let's look at the values for various values of n. So let's take n to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and look at the values of these polynomials. Well, this is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. This is going to be 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is going to be 0, 0, 1, 3, 6. This is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 
whatever it is. Um, anyway, all we're really interested in are these values here. And we can forget about all this rubbish down here. Now what we see from this is that um, given any integer polynomial, integer valued polynomial f of degree d, we can find an integer linear combination of n choose 0 up to n choose d with the same values at n equals 0, um, 1 up to d. And the reason for this is we can fix the value at 0 by choosing a suitable linear combination of this and then we can fix the value at 1 by choosing a suitable linear combination of this and that doesn't affect the value at 0. Then we can add an integer multiple of this and fix the value at 2 without affecting the values at 0 and 1 and so on. Um, so um, we've got this integer valued polynomial f of degree d and this is equal to a0 times n choose 0 plus a1 n choose 1 and so on up to plus a d n choose d for some a0 a1 up to a d um, and these are the same for n equals 0 up to d and now we've got two polynomials of degree d which are the same for d plus 1 um, values of the argument um, so these must be the same for all n. So our integer value polynomial is an integer linear combination of these binomial coefficients. Um, now there's a simple consequence of this. The leading coefficient of f n is of the form um, d factorial, um, sorry, um, some integer divided by d factorial times x to the d. And that's because um, that the leading coefficient of this polynomial here is 1 over d factorial. Of course, the leading coefficient need, need not be an integer as we've seen in, in, in the example n, n minus 1 over 2, for example. However, it is an integer if you multiply it by d factorial. Um, so let's see an example of this. Um, well, suppose we have a projective variety um, given by some homogeneous ideal i in k x naught up to x n. So the variety is just going to be the, the set of points where all elements of this ideal vanish. Then we can take the ring to be k x naught up to x n modulo i. Um, so this is the homogeneous coordinate ring of our variety. And this is graded. So the dimension of um, R n, so um, I guess I shouldn't call that n, the dimension of R k is a polynomial in k for k large. And the degree d is the dimension of the variety and d factorial times the leading coefficient is called the degree of the variety, which is an integer because we just said d factorial times the leading coefficient is an integer. So um, for an explicit example of this, let's just take a hypersurface in, um, in um, 
n-dimensional projector of space. So suppose i is just generated by f, where this is homogeneous and of degree um, m in n plus 1 variables. Um, then the Hilbert polynomial is just um, k plus um, n times all the way up to k plus 1 divided by n factorial minus k plus n minus m times all the way up to k plus 1 minus m divided by n factorial because these are the um, number of monomials in the polynomial ring k x naught up to x n and then you have to subtract ones that are this degree m polynomial times something which gives you which gives you this for k sufficiently large and if you work out the leading coefficient of this this turns out to be m k to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial plus something or other so the degree of the variety is equal to m which fortunately is the same as the degree of this polynomial here and the dimension is n minus 1 so the n minus 1 comes from this leading coefficient um, so next lecture we'll be showing how to use the Hilbert polynomial to define the um, dimension of a local ring.